Horror is a genre we're all familiar with, and that's the problem. Looking at horror movies, we see films with predictable stories and settings. However, a new movie is creating controversies in cinema, with people appraising the film's style and direction, and others walking out of theaters and damning the film entirely. The movie is called Skinamarink, and if you haven't heard of it, I don't blame you. I've actually never seen an ad for this movie, and only heard about it from Wendigoon discussing the movie on their livestream. And after watching the film for myself, I can understand the controversies. But before we get into the film, let's discuss the director and writer, Kyle Edward Ball. Kyle Edward Ball runs a YouTube channel called Bite Size Nightmares, where he films abstract videos of real nightmares that he finds through Reddit or its YouTube comments. His film style is very personal and uncomforting, with his use of off angles, strong lighting colors, and long close-ups of objects that are slightly out of frame. Elements that all filmmakers use in their films for drama and adding emphasis, however, these elements are everything that make up Kyle's videos. Rarely do you get a clear picture of the environment or what's taking place in the scene. Instead, each shot makes the viewer more lost until they can slowly piece together the meaning of the shot. Although his imagery is simple in most shots, the audio throughout the scene is where things come to light, during the breaking of static to hear a voice or a sound that connects the details we've sparsely collected. Skinamarink is no different. Each shot is off-center and lasts on screen longer than you'd expect it to. The camera cuts away to parts of the house that are not our focus, but adds the atmosphere. We see dark rooms, objects all over the floor, and long dark hallways we can't see the end of all making the house feel still and empty, the same feeling as if you just turned off the lights after leaving a room. The movie uses film grain over dark footage, which while looking at a still image makes you wonder if you saw something move subtly or if your eyes were just playing tricks on you. In terms of plot, the movie is pretty simple. Two kids wake up in their home with their dad gone and all the doors and windows have disappeared leaving them trapped. However, the plot isn't the focus of the movie. The real point of the movie is to disturb audiences, which it has. The movie has fallen under a lot of controversies based on its art style, but as well as its content around children. If you're sensitive to uh, bad things happening to children, then you probably shouldn't watch this film. However, if you can stomach it, I would suggest seeing the movie as watching it for myself. I haven't felt so anxious from a film before. The film uses children as easy sympathetic characters to root for as nothing is more innocent than a child. And trust me, it's hard not to grow attached to these kids. As the style of the film keeps us in the dark about what's going on, it also doesn't give us much detail about the children either. We hear their names Kevin and Kaylee, but never see their faces or any distinguishing features. The scares in this movie are very different from standard horror movies, as the jump scares are very limited and the real fear is from the atmosphere and the audio. The camera lingers on scenes longer than it should and you wait expecting something to jump out at you, but it never does. Hello? We get most information from audio over a still shot, and it never lets us know the big picture. Once you get used to all these long shots, when we finally see something move, it's even more scary. It's the slow burning horror that doesn't mind substituting a quick scare with tension that forces you to wait for it to finally be released and it holds that tension throughout the whole movie all the way to the last minute where I was only relieved with a title card. I want to get into spoilers for this movie so if you want to skip ahead just go to the timestamp on screen. I highly recommend watching this movie for yourself because no amount of words can do justice to how off this movie feels. It's now on Shudder so please go give it a watch. Now it's never clear what initially happened to the kids, whether this was caused by Kevin hitting his head while falling down the stairs, or if some demon just chose to torment these kids. It could even be symbolic of Kevin going into a coma, however I find that very unlikely. It's truly the lack of answers and infinite questions that could easily drive someone away from the film, as there's no real satisfying ending to their story or even an explainable start to it. Instead, we're just left watching these helpless children be trapped in a horrific fate doing things that no one wants to see a child do. Now nothing happens on camera, however the audio is more than enough to shock you to your core. Several scenes from this movie gave me chills down my body and made me so uncomfortable I had to look away, 
which is honestly scarier than any jump scare I've ever seen. We never know what this monster is capable of or even what it wants, we just see it manipulate the kids and warp the house around them. We also find out that whatever is keeping them here has been torturing them for longer than we know, since we are told by text on screen that it has been 572 days. We also get references of a time loop as the children's cartoon loops over and over, and at the end we see a blood splatter as a child cries before it disappears and reappears over and over again. We may never know what the monster or demon was, but not knowing makes it even more terrifying as nothing is scarier than the unknown. It's pretty obvious how Kyle Edward Ball's work resembles a lot of current internet horror series, specifically in the analog horror genre. Analog horror is a fairly recently defined genre of horror based on older analog technology such as VHS tapes, box televisions, and old photography reels as these mediums are what we see the story through. The dated presentation adds to the atmosphere and gives undertones of what you're watching wasn't intended to be seen. The first series popularizing the genre was the YouTube channel Local58 with the first upload you were on the fa- Proceed to the highlighted route. Continue on Holbrook Park Drive, then in 500 feet turn right onto North 38th Street. You will arrive at your destination in 2 hours and 28 minutes. In a quarter mile, turn left onto Merritt Parkway. You are on the fastest available route. In 2.8 miles, keep right to stay on service causeway H516. You will arrive at your destination in 14 minutes. Rerouting. Make a U-turn. Head east for one quarter of a mile, then follow signs for do not enter. Continue on unnamed road, then, in 300 feet, turn off your headlights. The rest of the series is stylized as old news VHS tapes that progressively got more and more creepy, eventually leading to a story the viewer could piece together. After the success and widespread know-abouts of the series, other YouTube series would also adapt the analog style, including Gemini Home Entertainment, Harmony and Horror, the Five Nights at Freddy's VHS series, which has one of my favorite sound bites ever. Michael, don't leave me here. <laughs> Michael, Michael, help me. And also the two most popular ongoing analog series of the Mandela Catalog and Kane Pixel's Backrooms. Another element to the analog horror genre is the information, or lack of, that the viewer receives. Each episode gives little elements of the plot that the viewer has to piece together throughout the whole series, as the details are usually given out of chronological order. This causes some details to go overlooked until later, or for a bigger reveal tying to an event the viewer already knows about. Y yes, yes, it's me. Is it, is it really you? Skinamarink's use of technology of the late 1900s fits the style of analog horror as most of the movie is centered around an old box TV showing old children's cartoons and uses of a landline and even from the grainy camera we're watching through. Even the cinematography doesn't show the audience everything in frame and waits to reveal more later in the story. This is in contrast to the standard horror film format where the plot is strongly linear and the horror usually comes off quick payoff jump scares instead of the ambient environment created around us. In modern horror cinema, there is a formula that is commonly used when the director wants to scare the audience. Show danger, build tension, release tension, then scare. 
This has been done so many times, and no matter how predictable it is, the formula doesn't change. For some audiences, this works fine. The people that like a little adrenaline of a scare, those who find other people's reactions funny, and even people who generally find those moments scary. However, as effective as it is for some, after that final jump, the tension quickly drops off. After a scene, there must be downtime to build up again, and when it starts building, you can usually guess when something will jump out again. Analog horror doesn't usually revolve around cyclical scares to spook people. Instead, it's the slow burning atmosphere, the tension that doesn't release, and the wait for something to happen even when nothing will. It's a much longer lasting feeling that lingers after the scene, because in the end, we just want to get the scare over with. Looking at Alex Kister's Mandela Catalog, a series about entities that copy and mimic people, we can see the difference in scares between two scenes. Let's look at a more formulaic scare from a scene from Mandela Catalog Volume 1. Let, 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 let me and Mark, I have a gift for you. you, you. I have a present. Surprise. We see a character, Mark, hiding in his room as something talks to him in a glitch and distorted voice to come outside. After telling the audience that it has been days, and no one is coming to help him, we hear him confront what's on the other side of the door. the door opens, we hear Mark yell, and a gunshot goes off. Everything is quiet, and the tension dies down. Although this scene is effective at creating tension, the only difference between this and a classic Hollywood jump scare would be a loud sound effect as the face appears. Let's look at another scene, this time from Mandela Catalog Volume 333, that doesn't follow this formula. We follow a police officer encountering an entity similar to how Mark did. We see the build up once again, this time the threat more clearly. And as the tension dies down, it crescendos back up. And at the end, an image of a distorted face that morphs in a way that sends chills down my spine every time, even after the image is gone. This is true horror. Not just being scared, but being so uncomfortably scared that it sticks with you. That's what Skinnamarink does so well. As glad as I am to see a movie so accustomed to the horror I love on YouTube, I'm not surprised about the criticism around it. It's definitely a slow movie, and I've criticized a lot of movies on pacing. However, the difference here is that the slow pacing in this film is necessary to add to the horror, and that slow pacing definitely can drive people away. However, analog horror needs to be slow. That's what makes it scary. 
It's not about being constantly in your face, it's about subtly creeping up on you and giving you chills. It's about mystery and taking pieces of information to figure out the story for yourself. That's why I don't think analog horror will translate well into films, but I don't want it to. I much prefer a mystery over a given plot. I like theory crafting and waiting to find more answers in another installment. Movies are too formulaic, and for the most part you know what you're getting into every time you start one up. Skinamarink was a nice change of pace for a movie. It was a horror that filled me with curiosity and dread and had me waiting for answers just to leave me with a few ominous clues before ending. Kyle has stated that Skinamarink does have a fully fleshed out story but won't explain it because that would take away from what the movie was intended to do. Scare and disturb audiences in a way that contemporary horror doesn't do. And that feeling of fear and the chills I got from watching the unknown are better than any story I could think of. This was my first video discussing a film, and I'm glad it was about a genre that I love. If you enjoyed the video, let me know by giving it a like and showing me I should do more videos like this. Let me know if you think analog horror should stay online, or if you think it would be widely accepted in cinema. I'm excited to see what everyone else thinks. And anyways, thank you all for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all later. Goodbye.